right, let's just jump in here. Um, Congressman, we want to be respectful of your time. First off, thank you for joining us again for the Georgia vote. We know we've seen you before, and, and now we are in crunch time here. Absolutely, Zach. You know, Georgia continues to be the center of the political universe, so we need to talk about this. So let's start here. What, in your view, are the stakes of this election? So the stakes of this election could not be more clear. Our freedoms and our future are on the ballot, Zach. Our economic freedom, our freedom to vote, our reproductive freedoms are all on the ballot. And I know what I'm voting for and the Georgia voters that I'm talking to every day over the course of the next 14 days are equally as concerned about all of these issues. That is why Vice President Harris spent two days in Battleground Georgia over the weekend. I met her at the tarmac and spent the full two days with her until she departed Hartsville Jackson International Airport. So I, I'm hearing it from voters all over the place as they're bringing their conversations directly to Vice President Harris, having those conversations with me. But voters in Georgia are fired up and already voting. Um, I want to talk to you about specifics. You mentioned reproductive rights. You mentioned the economy is some of the biggest issues. We hear that from voters who talk to us as well. If Vice President Harris becomes the next president, what's her plan to address these issues? So Vice President Harris has been very clear. Send her a Congress that will put a bill to codify Roe v. Wade across her desk and she will sign it into law, restoring reproductive freedom across this country, something that Donald Trump has bragged about, overturning Roe v. Wade. We've heard it firsthand here in Georgia with the tragic stories of the death of two women, Candy Miller and Amber Thurman, who had preventable deaths because they could not get the care that they needed right here in their home state of Georgia. I was with Amber Thurman's parents just on Saturday at Vice President Harris's rally here in Atlanta. I was with her sisters and her mom two weeks ago, sitting down with them, hearing their story. And her mom has never been political, but she's decided, she actually never even voted before, but she's voting in this election because she understands what happened to her daughter, what could have been prevented, should never happen to anyone else. And she is determined to make sure that Donald Trump does not get back in the White House. So that's what I'm hearing across the board, that people are voting for their freedoms. And when it comes to their economic freedom, I've been in conversation with especially a lot of black men who are raising families in this country who have a history in this country of not being able to build generational wealth because of so many things that have been stacked against them. And Vice President Harris has a plan to make sure that we can continue to build more black businesses, investing in that initial capital, but also making sure that we can sustain those businesses long term. And also down payment assistance to buy those first term home, first time homes, because we know that investment into home ownership builds generational wealth. And that is something that we need to do to close the racial wealth gap in this country, something that people are experiencing every day when trying to not just continue to get by, but to get ahead in this country. You mentioned the economy. I want to ask you about two other issues that we hear from voters a lot about being at the top of their priority list. That's inflation and illegal immigration. Some critics have argued that inflation has surged under Vice President Harris's role in the White House. Illegal immigration has surged during her roughly four years in office as well. And some critics say that she's responsible for that since she was the sitting vice president as this happened. What do you say to those critics? So, you know, I'm a member of the United States Congress. We had a bipartisan border deal on the table negotiated by conservatives in the U.S. Senate. And the deal was ready to be brought to the floor. Democrats were on board, Republicans were on board, until Donald Trump himself inserted himself into the process and said, oh no, we don't want a border deal because it might help Democrats in this election cycle. That is the sign of someone who is not serious about leading this country. Because we had a deal on the table that was bipartisan and we could have done something to make sure that our border was sec secure, make sure that people could come here and have a legal pathway to citizenship, something that most Americans agree on. But Donald Trump, said, no, let's not get a border deal done. Let's make sure that we don't give Democrats something that could possibly help them win the election. So I blame Republicans who agreed with Donald Trump and took his advice and stepped away from a deal that they negotiated. Does she bear any responsibility though? She was in office, she was the border czar at the beginning of her time as vice president. 
Does she bear any responsibility for this? So, Zach, I'm going to correct you on her being the border czar. That is something that other people have made up. That is not an official term, not something that was assigned by the White House. She it was, was the, part of her she portfolio. Was the vice, well, her portfolio was not to be a border czar. Her portfolio was to find out a plan for people coming from South America and what was driving immigration, what was driving migrants across the border. There is no such term as border czar, but that is what has been the narrative. And Term, yeah, what terms we, aside, what, she was, well, the terms matter, though, Zach. Terms matter. She but what had a we responsibility. Know, what we know is that in that responsibility, as the as someone who comes in to break a tie in the Senate, as the vice president does, she was ready to come in and support that bipartisan border deal that was on the table that had been negotiated by conservative Republicans and Democrats alike until Donald Trump inserted himself into the process. So that is who is to blame for us not having a deal on the table so that we can create a pathway to citizenship, a legal pathway to citizenship, and make sure that we are having security at our borders. Let's pivot here quickly in the time we have left. Uh, two last questions for you. Georgia Democrats and National Democrats have gone to court to try to block a handful of recently passed state election board rules, including a rule that would have required a hand count of ballots. A Fulton County judge has struck down that rule. But I want to ask you, why did Georgia Dems go to court to block that rule in the first place? So this was never a decision about making sure that voters have access to the ballot. And Georgia Democrats stand every day to make sure that not just Democrats have access to the ballot, but every voter who wants to cast a ballot in the state should have access to not only cast that ballot, but have it counted and certified. So that's what we stand for every day. I serve in the seat that was held by the late Congressman John Lewis, so I know my obligation to stand up for free and fair access to the ballot at every opportunity. Georgia Democrats d went to court over this because that rule was meant to sow confusion and chaos into the electoral process so that when Donald Trump loses Georgia once again, he can say that, see, this didn't match up or this was the reason, but we're not going to stand for that. And a judge saw fit that this was just a ploy to create more confusion and chaos this late in the election process. So I am glad that we got this decision that is standing on the side of voters, not necessarily Democratic voters, but all voters who deserve a free and fair access to the ballot. If this same rule was passed at a time where it wasn't within a few months of Election Day, would Georgia Democrats support it then? Well, it depends on where we are in the cycle and what is happening with our local state board of elections. Local state board of elections are already doing work that should be commended. And these are people who come in, they're not paid a lot. These, these are jobs where people just want to step in and do something to serve their democracy all over the state. Republicans, Democrats, independents alike, stepping up to serve their communities. And they should not be subjected to the chaos and confusion and especially the threats that they've been under for the last four years with Donald Trump and the way he's been attacking everyday election officials in this country. We're short on time. I want to end here with just about 60 seconds to go. We are in crunch time of this election. Election right. day is just a few days it's away. It's election day today. Election day is every day. The final pitch from Georgia Democrats and National Democrats to a potential voter who is watching this right now is what? Your freedoms and your future are on the ballot. There's a stark contrast this election cycle. Kamala Harris will not be a president for Democrats or Republicans. She'll be a president for all Americans. Go to IWillVote.com slash Georgia and find your nearest early voting location and go and cast your vote early. Congresswoman, thank you very much. Thank you.